In this video, we're going to look at the classic problem of a simple bar and tension, but we're going to write out everything in our kind of formal tensor notation just to try to make some connections with how we might apply these more general laws, at least in a simple situation. Uh, we're not going to really come up with any particularly new insight here. It's just to try to make a connection between what we know already and this more general theory of linear elasticity. So here I have a simple bar and tension, has a cross-sectional area A, I'm applying a load P here at the ends, and here I'm gonna orient, orient my uh, coordinate system so that X, Y is the plane of the cross-section and Z is the axial direction of the bar and tension. So to solve this problem, um, we're really just gonna start with a hypothesis that we can essentially guess the form of the stress tensor and then kind of go from there. And so when we analyzed this problem previously, we said that if we looked at a little element uh, here in the center, anywhere along the bar, there really were only normal stresses along the bar when we oriented them in this direction. So what we're gonna hypothesize then is that our stress tensor is gonna have the following form. So in the XY plane, there's basically no stresses. So everything is zero. And in the Z plane, in the Z direction, there's only the normal stress which acts in the ZZ direction. And so that's why I've put this here. So X, Y, Z direction, X, Y, Z force. So there's only a Z force and the Z direction. So in this case, we're assuming that the stress tensor is constant at every point in this bar. So it's just a single number. So if you remember our laws, which we wrote in a uh, compact form as the divergence of the stress tensor has to equal zero. Um, you remember that those laws were given as a bunch of partial derivatives. So we take the derivatives in the x, y, and z direction of various components of this. You can go back and look at the exact form of the previous one. But the main issue here is that this number is a constant. So if I take the derivative with respect to any coordinate direction, I'm going to satisfy this zero condition. So I'm gonna satisfy this condition uh, automatically by assuming that the stress tensor is constant. Uh, I'm also going to satisfy our symmetry uh, argument because this tensor is symmetric because it has zeros. So therefore, at every point in space, sum of the moments equals to zero. So now let's use our constitutive law to write out what the strain tensor would be in this case. So if I su simply substitute our assumption for the stress tensor into the strain tensor, I get something that looks like this. And here I factored out this common factor of P over A that's gonna show up uh, everywhere. And if we do a little bit of manipulation here and we kind of rearrange things, and we remember our relationships between G, Poisson's ratio, and Young's modulus, we could rewrite this matrix and you should try this yourself just to believe that it's true uh, quite simply. So when we do a little bit of manipulation, this is we can rewrite our strain tensor in this form, where again, we only have axial strains. And in the Z direction, uh, we have the strain just due to the stress sigma P over A, so the normal stress, uh, just like we had before. And in the X and Y direction, so in the cross-sectional area, we have the Poisson ratio effect of the, of the bar uh, shrinking. Now we can remember if we were to make the connection uh, to our displacement gradients, um, we, we can look at what the displacement field would look like under this deformation. And so if you, were, if you go back and look at your notes on what these values were, we can just make the connection. The X derivative of the X component of the displacement field is equal to this value. Likewise for the vertical component. And then finally, this component here will be simply that. Now this is these are easy equations to integrate because I just have partial derivatives equaling constants. So that becomes a quite simple set of equations. And so this would be our final result for the displacement vectors u, v, and w, uh, which we know up to a constant of integration. Now the constant of integration, we would have to set by some uh, condition. And in this case, probably the easiest thing to do is uh, set 
the displacement to be zero at the center and maybe set our coordinate system to be both at the center and the xy plane and in this plane but in that case it's completely arbitrary so if we set a particular point to be fixed at x y and z equals to zero then our constants of integration go away and we have a simple formula like this and so what does that mean well it's quite uh, simple because we can we can look at what these displacement vectors look like in different planes so in the cross-sectional plane as well as in the in the plane of this okay so let's sketch some displacement field vectors so i'm going to uh, kind of exaggerate the cross section here. So I'm going to draw the cross section in the xy plane. So this, this would be the cross section of the beam. And then this is the distance along the beam. So this will be the yz plane. So, so going back to our model rubber beam here, this plane is the cross section. This one would be this one. So here I'm just exaggerating the size uh, just to make it easier to draw things. So the vector field that we found for the displacement all has this common factor of p over ea. And if we think about the units there, this is a dimensionless quantity, right? Because E is force per unit area, right? Stress is the units of E. So when I multiply force per unit area by area, I get force. So force over force, so it's dimensionless. So each of the vectors for the displacement has the coordinate system x, y, z. Uh, these two in the x, y plane have a factor of minus nu Poisson's ratio. And remember, like a typical metal, this might be something like a third. Okay, so let's sketch the vectors in the xy plane. So if I go out uh, some distance in x, uh, but zero in y, my vector would be uh, have a certain quantity of Poisson's ratio in the x direction, negative, and zero in this direction. So I'm just going to use kind of a uh, one unit here. So there's my kind of vector pointing that way. So what that means is this point moves from here to here. Okay. If I move to the left in x, now I'm at a negative x, my vector becomes positive, meaning it also points back towards the origin. So if I plotted the vector here, it would be of opposite direction of that one, but pointed kind of towards the center. And by the same argument, I think you can see that the vectors at the top and the bottom are going to have also that same magnitude and also be pointing inwards. If I go to the corners, so equal value of x and y, I'm going to have a vector at 45 degrees coming in. So each of the corners is going to move uh, kind of inwards like that. And again, this is just a sketch, so I'm not being super careful with the magnitude. Uh, but we're going to have kind of a flow like that. Now if I half the value of x, so now I'm going to look at kind of points uh, along here, so kind of closer in, we see that the value of the vector decreases. So even though the direction is the same, if I kind of moved in halfway, my vector would look like that. And so the rest I'll just sort of sketch, would be kind of all pointing inwards again. And at the center, when x and y are zero, there is no vector. So everything just kind of flows to the center uh, with the actual displacement uh, being greater out at the edges, uh, but the actual strain being kind of uniform throughout. So there we go. So the vector field, the displacement field looks something like that. All the points move inwards. Now let's look at the yz plane. Very similar argument, except now our z vectors are positive. So if I move out this way, it means the displacement is outwards. And now you should be careful not to equate the magnitude of the vector in this sketch is in this sketch because I'm kind of drawing them at different scales just for clarity. But we see if we go along a point here where y is equal to zero, so the center line, our vector is going to be zero in z. So it gets large out at the ends and kind of by the same argument here, as I move kind of inwards, it gets uh, smaller, but also blows out. And if, as we get closer and closer to the origin here, the vectors get kind of smaller and smaller and smaller. So something like that. Um, but now if we move off axis, so now I go up in y, uh, so y isn't zero, 
we have a vector which has a negative component downwards. So that means if I look at the edge out here, that the, each vector is going to have a uh, com the equal component in the z direction touching this line, right? So they're all going to come out by the same magnitude, but they're going to kind of slope downwards. So one here would follow some kind of line like that. One here would follow some kind of line like that. And this kind of amount of the y component is going to decrease as we decrease in y. So the vector field is going to be kind of pointing out and down. Now again, I'm probably not quite drawing the uh, y and z to scale uh, because the amount of downward flow is going to be quite a bit less than the amount of outward flow, especially if the bar is long and skinny. Because if you remember our little model here, and we look at the amount of deformation in the z direction, uh, it's quite extensive compared to how much you see the, the thing uh, contract. But I'm just sort of drawing this for effect here. If we want to be more accurate, we need to go to the computer, which we can do real quickly here. So here we've plotted those vector fields. So here I have the z y plane. So this is the length of the bar. So we see the flow outward from the center point where we just sort of by definition define the bar not to be moving. So it's held still there. We see the flow increases as we move away from the center. So that makes sense because as the bar gets longer, the amount of absolute deformation gets greater and greater. And then we also see the kind of inward flow due to the, the shrinking of the bar. So material point moves from here to here, it kind of collapses inward. So all along the bar, we should see that the vertical component, the flow downwards, should be constant and uniform, and all the material points should move downwards, whereas um, along the length of the bar, the points here move outwards more and more just because the deformation kind of stacks. Here we show the xy plane or the cross section and we just see a uniform flow inwards. So you can see by actually plotting in plotting software the arrows as little quivers, uh, we can easily visualize the deformation and where material points move from the initial to the final configuration.